I'm excited to bring you part two of our Patagonia adventure where we hike, bike, and paddle our way through Chile and Argentina's Patagonia, one of the top three prettiest places in the world I've ever been to. I can't wait to continue this adventure with you, so let's get started. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. In part two today, we will finish up our adventures down in Patagonia. We started our Patagonia adventure in part one on the Chilean side of Patagonia. Patagonia is actually a combination of Chile and Argentina. So in Chile, we hiked the amazing, one of the best hikes in the world, the W Trek, where we saw some amazing granite peaks. We saw avalanches, not where we were in any danger, of course. We got to see glacial lakes, tons of wildlife, beautiful flowers. It was just an amazing, amazing, beautiful, beautiful hike. And we finished up part one by finishing up the W Trek onto Lake Gray. And so that's where we'll start today. On my Patagonia trip, I went with one of my all-time favorite adventure tour companies, Active Adventures, which is one of my affiliates. And remember, as one of my listeners, you can save 200 bucks off of any of their worldwide tours using the exclusive promo code ATA200, A-T-A-200. And that promo code is good for not just Active Adventure worldwide tours, but also their sister company, Austin Adventures, which offers a lot more family-friendly and some softer adventures around the globe. Active won't let me publish the promo code on the internet, so you will see it in the show notes, or if you forget, you can always email me for the code at kit at activetraveladventures.com. You can also find it on any of the travel planners that Active goes to, and you get access to the travel planners if you get the monthly newsletter, which you can get by either clicking in the box in the show notes, email me at kit at activetraveladventures.com, or going to the website and clicking on the newsletter button there. I don't spam you. I don't sell your email. It's just a way for us to have a two-way communication. And again, it's only one email a month. One reason I love Active Adventure Tours is that they always mix things up. Most tours are predominantly hiking, but they generally throw in some biking and paddling. And now that we'd hiked our way on the W Trek to Lake Gray, we had our fingers crossed. For a real treat, weather permitting, we were going to see kayak Lake Gray and try to get close to the glacier and the icebergs. I couldn't wait. To keep us warm in these frigid waters, we were outfitted with helmets, wetsuits, booties, a rain jacket, and a kayak thermal skirt that attaches to the kayak to keep the water from splashing inside where we sit. There were thermal wetsuit gloves integrated onto our paddles. After a thorough safety lesson, off we went. Betsy manned the rudder in the back while I was up front of our kayak and hoped to get some great photos, many of which are in my video. The winds were quite strong, and I know the guide was monitoring things to keep us safe. We had to paddle really hard against the wind to make it to the cove we were all supposed to meet up. There we got close to our first icebergs. How beautiful. The sun had melted the exterior, so they all glistened and sparkled, all smooth, shiny, and clear blue or frosty white. Older glaciers get the blue color from the way the sun distorts the compression of the ice. It was magical. Our guide reassesses and says that with this wind, he'll get us close to the glacier, but we'll only be able to stay a short time for safety reasons. We get it. There are some white caps out here, and nobody wants to tip over. But he said with over 2,000 paddlers last year, only six capsized, and I'm guessing from leaning over to take a selfie. These kayaks are really well balanced and with our knees pressed against the sides are very stable, provided you don't lean sideways. It is magnificent, but the winds are picking up even more speed. So too soon, it's time to return home. But now we have the winds at our back and we zip back to the launch area. What a blast. This was definitely a highlight. Our next day is an easy day. About half of us opted for the Touch the Ice Glacier add-on where you can take a boat over to the glacier and hike alongside it. With its jagged spiraling peaks, this is not a hikeable glacier like the Franz Josef Glacier in New Zealand. I'll put a link to my experience down there in the show notes as well. At least in this section that we can see, this glacier is not flat enough to walk safely on. And since I would be on lots of glaciers in Antarctica, my next adventure, I opted instead to do the hike to the two swinging bridges and to get a peek at the other side of the glacier. 
Karina, our local guide, kept our pace very slow and steady throughout our W Trek hike. While I normally hike at a much faster pace, I noticed about going at Karina's set pace of, on a sense, say one step a second, one 1,000 step, take a step, two 1,000, take another step. I wasn't at all tired at the end of the day when normally if I do a hard 14 mile hike, I would be pooped when I was finished. I have to remember to do this. I never seem to do that, but that is a super effective way not to be exhausted. Really take it slow and steady and you won't lose your energy. Dan, who must have teased Karina about our slow pace, got a taste of fast Karina on the Hanging Bridges hike. I think she decides she's going to show Dan that this gal can hike. So up and off we climbed at a blistering pace, by far the hardest my lungs had worked out all week. But boy, was it fun. Karina knew everything about the flora and fauna, and I pestered her throughout our adventure. One mushroom we saw often, a round orange ball that grows from galls on the beech trees, is one of the indigenous called breadfruit. You have to wait until it reaches a certain walnut size, and then you peel off the ball and bite into it. It doesn't have a whole lot of taste, but was a staple in the locals' diet. Sadly, all the region's indigenous people were killed off some time ago. I was most interested in learning about the indigenous Selknam people. I had seen figurines and images of the Selknam in their interesting red and white horizontally striped outfits, one of which includes a hammerhead protrusion coming off a guy's head. It was all quite fascinating. There isn't a whole lot known about them, but from what I gathered at a museum, some of the men would dress up in these fanciful costumes to scare the children into behaving, similar to my parents' threats with Santa not bringing gifts unless I behaved. In the Sikh of tradition, when the boys reach puberty, they're invited to a ceremony where they're told that these red and white spirits are actually humans, but they do not tell the girls, although presumably they figure it out later. You may have heard of the Tierra del Fuego region down here. This was the main settlement of the Selknams when the Spanish arrived. They saw all the fires in the beach that the Selknam used for heating and cooking and named the land the Land of Fire, a.k.a. Terra del Fuego literally translates to land of fire. In the morning, again, weather permitting, as in this region, it's all about the weather. If the winds weren't too strong, we would take a boat ride to see the three sides of Gray Glacier and then head down the length of the lake to meet our van. However, if the winds were too strong, we'd have to hike the seven miles back. Fingers crossed. I don't mind the hike, which would be a reverse of our last day, but I sure wanted to see the glacier up close by boat. The wind gods were kind, and off we went by boat. When we were loading, one of the ship's mates took a pickaxe to a nearby iceberg and cracked off three large chunks. Puzzled, I just stored that in the back of my mind. It turns out that as part of our boat tour, we would get a Pisco Sour, the local favorite alcoholic beverage. Pisco is made from grapes, and the alcohol is mixed with citrus for a pleasant, somewhat sweet drink. The ice for our drink was a chunk of iceberg. Now, how cool is that? As our boat neared one of the faces of the massive glacier, we would all go outside for a closer look. The wind was pretty strong, so I'm not sure how strong is too strong to call off the boat ride. All I can tell you is that I took a very windy selfie with my hair sticking straight up in a halo around my skull like I was rekindling the punk rock look. It's quite impressive, and I'll include that with the monthly newsletter if you need a chuckle. Not putting that shot on the website. And don't forget, if you haven't signed up for the free monthly email, you can do so from the show notes on your phone right now while you're listening or from the website activetraveladventures.com or just by writing me at kit at Active Travel Adventures. I don't spam you. You'll just get one email a month and I also don't sell your information. It's just a fun way for us to have a two-way conversation. Plus you get access to all the travel planners and any downloads I put together for the show. After our glacier boat tour, it's time to head up the lake to finish our tourist alpine part of the tour. But there's one more complication. Due to the strike, the beach is closed. So once we disembark, we can't walk the 10 minutes across the beach to a hotel where our van waits. So a ferry system has been rigged up and it takes a while for a small boat to shuffle us back and forth across the small waterway. Everyone is rooting for the rangers, so none of us mind the inconvenience. Once we all make it to shore, it's on to the van and back to civilization in Puerto Natales once again. What an adventure we've had in Chile. 
Before we move on, I should note that if you want to take this Active Adventures tour, but really are not into some of the backpacking that we did, they have an option where you hike out, but as day hikes, if they have enough people interested. And if you can't get away for the entire 14 days, you can end your trip at this point as Dan and Ken did. But for the rest of us, we continued on. The next day, we crossed the border into Argentina and head to El Calafate, the gateway to Glacier National Park, home of the famous Fitzroy Peaks. El Calafate sits on Lake Argentina, the third largest lake in South America. We'll see the famous Perito Moreno Glacier, and I thought the Gray Glacier was cool. It has nothing on Perito Moreno. We also hiked to see the famous Fitzroy and surrounding glacial peaks, plus some breathtaking glacial lakes and lagoons. We'll see more flamingo butts and bike through beach forests to check out beautiful waterfalls, all while building up my courage muscles by going downhill on a mountain bike over loose rocks. And speaking of rocks, Argentina rocks. Here's what we did in this cool country. On the way to El Calafate, we take a rest stop at a historic restaurant in the middle of nowhere on a river. It turns out that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were here once and their photos are on the wall. Local legend has it that they survived and came down here after the fake shootout. Who knows? Maybe it's true. El Calafate is an upscale town, a bustling hiker and climbing town with plenty of restaurants, pubs, and shopping to satisfy anyone. It's worth a day or two to chill out at the end of your adventure, as this is the town we'll return to after our visit to the National Park at the conclusion of our tour. So you, you're you going to be here anyway. Tack on a couple extra days before you head back to the airport. You'll, you'll be glad you did. We arrive at El Calafate in time for lunch, where I had a delicious lamb stew and took a taste of Sandy's guanaco pot pie that was also quite tasty. After lunch, we have a free afternoon, so I go in search of cash, which turns out to be a challenge, and to explore this cute town. They've got everything here that an upscale hiking and climbing town needs, including laundry, which was also on the top of our list. There are endless cute restaurants and bars, but like I said, first I need to get some Argentinian pesos. Money is funny down here. Inflation is a serious issue and currently runs around 90% a year in late 2022. So while we are currently complaining back home about inflation, we ain't seen nothing compared to what the Argentinians are going through. Thus, US dollars are king, and you are king if you have cash. And if you have cash, you get a much better exchange rate on the street rate than in the bank rate. So here, pay attention to this for when you go down. I can save you some money. So first of all, when you're going down there, try to bring American dollars. Nice, crisp $100 bills, $20 bills with not scars or tears. They've got to look good. But if that doesn't work and you don't want to carry cash, an alternative to getting cash is to wire yourself money via Western Union. I wired myself money to Western Union, but the local Western Union was closed. You could also go to the post office. There's a branch there where you can get some money. But there the line is out the door with like 50 people waiting. No good. I don't have the patience to wait on that. So I went to another office, but they're closed for the day. And there I beat some people that lived about an hour from me. And we discussed our mutual par problem part ways. Further down the street, I see a money changer. I know I'm not going to get a great rate, but at least I can convert some of the little bit of U.S. I have left so I'll have some local currency. Because remember, you've got to pay the tips in cash. And a lot of places, you know, while they take credit cards, you don't want to stiff the staff. So I go in to change my last $40 U.S. And she says she can. However, if I go upstairs in the restaurant next door, I'll get an even better rate. Sure, I don't know. She's very sweet saving me a little bit of money and costing herself some. So I go ahead, and instead of getting 150 pesos for dollar, I get 260 by going in. It's technically the black market, but nobody gets in trouble for it because everybody does it. When I leave, I see my new acquaintances, and they're getting the same scoop from that same helpful lady in the money exchange. And get this, had I been able to get cash from Western Union, I would have gotten an even better exchange rate. It's crazy. I know the government's trying to get things back in line, but from now, when you go to Argentina, and like I said, they had a, a major election, and Mile is trying to, to change things, so, so get the latest scoop before you go. But 
I'm going to guess that it's going to take years for them to turn around the situation. So I would bring plenty of crisp new U.S. dollars and you'll get almost twice the value of the bank rate when you go. And if you want to see some nature while you're in El Calafate, a quick walk down to the nearby Laguna Nimes Lagoon will showcase a ton of birds. You'll see lots of flamingo butts plus ducks and geese. And as you'll recall from the last show, the flamingos mostly have their heads in the water looking for food, which is shrimp and algae. So what you usually see instead of the full flamingo standing like you'll see in a postcard is a butt sticking out of the water and it looks like a pink buoy. One day I'm going to look at my photos and wonder why I took so many photos of pink buoys. I found it very interesting that in this region of Patagonia, if you look at the map with both countries on it, there's no borderline between Chile and Argentina around here. There was once a scuffle and both sides tried to claim it. A young man they named the Perito Moreno Glacier after got lost in these woods for five years and learned the mountains quite well during that time. So Argentina hired him to help establish where the border between the nations should be. They considered runoff to the Atlantic versus the Pacific, but some mountains did both, so that didn't work. They tried battling, and an officer got killed, and they decided it wasn't worth losing a life over, so they pretty much decided just to leave the map blank. A pretty cool solution, I thought. There is a memorial to the man killed over the border skirmish that we saw on our bike ride. They want to remember what's important. Those mountain peaks are up so high and icy and you can't live on them anyway, so why fight over it, right? They also have some fascinating stories about the technical mountain climbers, mostly from France, Italy, and Germany, who came to this area to claim the first to summit boasts, but that is for someone else's program. Here on the Active Travel Adventures podcast, we talk about things that you and I can do, especially if we train. On our second day here, we headed over to the famous Perito Moreno Glacier. It's one of the highlights of this region. I have to admit, it was indeed much prettier than what I thought was the beautiful gray glacier that we'd seen in Chile. I think it's because the Perito Moreno Glacier is more dramatic. It's got spikes poking out of the facade. It's very, very, very appealing. With a local guide, we got to take a nice hike with several viewpoints to get a closer look. This glacier calves a lot too, and it's not unusual to see a calf. I just caught a splash and just missed the main event by the time my eyes focused on what was going on. But it was quite something. There was a boat down by the glacier that looked so tiny next to this mass of ice, and I'll bet that boat held 50 or more people. The next day, we headed to El Chaten. I love this town. Think Moab with a South American flair, maybe 20 years before it got discovered. Everyone's walking around with their backpacks or their climbing gear, their mountain biking gear. They're here to have fun. It's got a very cool outdoorsy vibe. If I were younger, I'd buy some investment property down here. There are plenty of breweries and good restaurants all surrounded by massive peaks, including its most famous Fitzroy. That's right, you can see Fitzroy without even leaving town. And one thing I love about this town is you can just walk from downtown directly to the trailheads. How cool is that? And that's exactly what we did in our first trek with our new local guide, Lucy. Lucy, like Karina, knows her local flora and fauna and geeked out on as much as I do. So like with Karina, I'm hoping that my incessant questions didn't drive her batty. We took a modest hike up to see the Mirador Laguna Torre, where you get to see the lake with a backdrop of majestic mountains. It's a great warm-up for tomorrow's hike, which will be a bit more challenging. The morning's hike will be just over 14 miles with more than 2,600 feet or 800 meter elevation gain and loss, but it's worth it. The clouds mostly covered old Fitzroy, but we got to see its lovely neighbors, my personal favorite being El Solo, the one by itself with its top face covered in glacier. We had snow flurries off and on for much of the hike, although it wasn't sticking to the ground. It made for a pretty backdrop. When we get to the top, we can see the lake down below, and I think we are finished as that's where we stop for lunch. But wait, there's more. It's an eye shot of where we were sitting, so I wondered why we'd bother hiking over to the next hill, but I dutifully follow Lucy. Now I get it. There's a beautiful, clear glacial blue lake tucked away on the other side of the hill that you can only see with that little bit of extra climb. Up the right side of the mountain, heading to the lake, we see ski tracks. 
I cannot believe some people drag their skis all the way up here and then even crazier, ski down that super steep slope. But we do see one such crazy person heading back down the trail with his skis. I sure wish we got to see somebody ski though. The weather is very changeable today and we no sooner add a layer than the sun comes out and we remove the layer. It's that kind of a day and this is to be expected in Patagonia. The cold wind and rain along with the colliding tectonic plates is what shapes these dramatic peaks. And as my mother would drill into me, there isn't bad weather, just poor clothing choices. Gratefully, I have packed my day pack appropriately so I'm never too cold except once on the last day for a bit. I brought my thin wool gloves and my waterproof gloves. I probably should also pack my thick wool gloves for that last day's hike. But with the waterproof ones, while not quite as warm, they were modestly sufficient. The only thing I packed that I did not use, but I'm still glad that I brought, is my rain pants. If I had my regular hiking rain pants that zip up the side, I would have used them. But since I'm going to Antarctica and needed thermal waterproof pants, I brought ski pants without lower zippers, not thinking about getting them on without removing my boots. I didn't want to have to take off my pants and boots to put them on unless I was desperate, which gratefully I never was. Most everyone else wore their rain pants at one time or another, even if just to block the wind. Our next day was another super fun day. We went mountain biking. I've only been on a mountain bike three times prior, so going down the hills on uneven terrain can be a bit twitchy for me. When I went on a day mountain biking tour in Moab, my guide instructed me, trust the bike. So whenever we were going down a steep rocky hill, and by the way, these were little used country roads, not single track paths, I would repeat to myself my new mantra, trust the bike, trust the bike, trust the bike, trust the bike, in hopes that I wouldn't break as my brain was screaming for me to do so. Somehow the better mountain bikes and tires know how to go over uneven and big rocks. Happily, I don't think one of us fell. We biked through forest and fields, stopping often to admire a waterfall to check out pink flamingo butts in a lagoon. Our bike ride was thrilling and one of the highlights of the tour for me. Thinking back, I think the reason the sea kayaking around icebergs and glaciers and my mountain biking down rocky hills were highlights is because doing these activities takes me outside my comfort zone. I'm confident in my hiking abilities and I'm far less so in biking or paddling where I feel like I have less control and I don't know that I have a high enough skill level. Half of our group included mountain bikers from Colorado. They, of course, had no issues and zoomed far ahead of the back half of us. This trail would be mild for them, so I think that the fact that it was challenging for the rest of us probably means we enjoyed it more, even though we all got to appreciate the beauty surrounding us. I guess what I'm trying to say is, whenever possible, try to put yourself in situations that challenge you a bit. Do that plus one I often mention that's doing something a little bit harder than your skill and put you outside of your comfort level. You'll expand your skills, plus you get more out of it and you become more confident the more often you do this. Push yourself. Try to get comfortable being uncomfortable and you'll have one heck of a time. But of course, train too. All of us were fit and had properly trained for this adventure, which was pretty hard. Not only do you have to have the endurance to hike a hard 14 mile day, but you need to be able to do this and be this active day after day. If you need help planning your training regimen, you can get a free consultation with my affiliate Becky at Trailblazer Wellness to see if you're a good fit. Becky can customize a program for whatever adventure you have cooked up using whatever equipment you've already got. You'll get access to online training videos to show you the proper form, and Becky will be there to coach you along the way. I'll put a link in the show notes. And be sure to mention Active Travel Adventures to get my exclusive 10% discount. If our bike ride wasn't pretty enough, after lunch we went on a hike to see the blue and green lagoons. And when they say blue, they're talking about a color that's hard to describe. Think electric blue, not neon, but such a piercing, deep, rich blue that it doesn't look real. I'll put a picture on the website and it won't do it justice, but at least you'll get an idea. The Green Lagoon wasn't nearly as intriguing. Does that mean we're getting jaded by beauty around here? Maybe that's the sign of a great trip. Sadly, all good things must come to an end and our next and final hike is a doozy to once again try to see Fitzroy. We will climb seven miles in hopes of a final glimpse, but the weather does not look promising. We can hike directly from our hotel across town to the trailhead 
And from there, we go up through the beech forest, and it seems like beech trees called lengas here dominate the vegetation. They must be striking in the fall, and I mentally bookmarked this fact. We do the customary layers on, layers off as we ascend. We are in the protection of the trees, off come the layers. Exposed in pasture land, or once we break tree line, on we pile the layers. On the last push to the top, we have a panoramic view that takes your breath away. And I'm thinking this, even though a lot's covered by the clouds. I can only imagine what it must look like on a clear day. It was one of my favorite views. Perhaps I'm not so jaded after all. But it's getting cold and windy and sometimes rainy. But we finally make it to the top and I never saw us eat lunch so fast. I put on all of my layers and it was so cold, meaning I had five layers covering my core. My legs felt fine on my pants. so I didn't bother with those rain pants, but my hands were cold since they were bare as I ate my sandwich. I had barely finished my sandwich when my group started en masse heading downhill. I followed Sandy's lead and shoved my pound cake dessert into a side pocket to eat for when we next took a break. I get it. I was freezing too. We had been blessed with almost perfect weather our entire two weeks, so I guess it was only fitting that we got to experience all of Patagonia's weather. So it was good to take the biting cold, piercing rain and wind for a spell on our last hike. Fortunately, it didn't last long, but at least we got to say that we experienced it. As we headed down the mountain for the last time, I kept wondering, is this the last condor? Is that the last fire bush? Is that the last orchid? The last anemone, etc.? You often never know when something ends up being the last time, so I tried to savor them all. Before long, we were down and back to town to catch our van back to El Calafate. What a fantastic adventure. I was hoping to see a gaucho, an Argentinian cowboy, on our way back. I'm picturing the debonair, colorful, woven wool poncho that also dobbles as a saddle blanket and sleep gear, the loose-fitting trousers called bombachas, belted with a tirador, and the beret. It seems like cowboy hats are not going to work with these heavy winds, so they wear these saucy berets down here. I was out of luck on this ride, but did get to see some cow herders in berets on my bus ride to Puerto Natales a couple of days later. After getting cleaned up, we meet for a special dinner. At the hotel, we stayed at El Calafate, the Patagonia Queen, which I must say was one of my favorite on the trip. They built a special room for active adventures since they're there all the time. It features a private dining table and large built-in grill to roast famous Patagonian barbecue. We ate, I think, five different kinds of roasted cuts of beef along with salad, freshly baked bread, all washed down with Argentinian Merlot. I think the sausage was my favorite. And even though we were stuffed to the gills, we all managed to woof down the delicious and not overly sweet cake. And I don't even have a sweet tooth. It was a feast to remember and a great way to celebrate the end of a fantastic adventure together. In the morning after breakfast, we all went our separate ways. Some flew out of El Calafate back home. Sandy and I independently stayed a couple of extra days. Then Sandy flew back to South Africa and I took the local bus back to Puerto Natales and then onward to Punta Arenas. A piece of advice here. I'm very careful about scouting out public transport ahead of time. I will usually go to the terminal and check it out the day before so I know I can find it and where to go. I try to buy my ticket in advance to avoid miscues and bad information on websites. But one thing I forgot is that on my El Calafate to Puerto Natales bus, I would be crossing borders. Fortunately, I planned to arrive 30 minutes early. When I got there, it was obvious the bus was almost fully loaded. I show my ticket from my phone and the driver motions for me to check with the desk inside, which I remembered was swamped. It dawns on me about the border then. I'm like, oh dear. Of course, they want to check to make sure I have all the right paperwork, which in this case is my passport and at the time a COVID vax card or a negative test. Fortunately, that large line moved right along, so there was no worry about missing my quite comfortable bus that left right on time. Yet another mistake to add to the ledger not to repeat again. I got lucky that time that the line moved quickly. My Patagonia trip makes my fifth tour with Active Adventures. There is a reason I keep going back. Yes, because of my affiliate relationship, they give me a discount. And whenever you use my promo code, remember it's at to 200, it'll save you 200 bucks off. You're not only saving money, but you're helping to support the show at no additional cost to you. I have spent a small fortune with Active Adventures on my tours with them because I know I'm going to have a trip of a lifetime. Make that I've had five trips of a lifetime. As my Scottish friend Jamie says, who says you only get one, right? 
I knew I would probably never make it back this far south to Patagonia. And I wanted to make sure, 100% sure that I had an exceptional trip. So I booked my adventure with Active Adventures. I met a couple who came all the way down here and they were going to go around the various agencies trying to line up day tours to do some of the things that we did in our tour. Sure, they could see a lot of it, but how much time did they waste trying to line the trips up and then waiting for a bus or van to pick up the people from the different hotels and then end up getting the usually shortened visits once they finally got there? Our trip was seamless. If the day required transport, a van was ready to take us directly where we had to go. While we had a short hike, the mountain bikes were taken off the trailer and pre-sized for us individually and ready to ride when we returned. None of our time was wasted. At dinner at well-chosen restaurants, a table was reserved and waiting for us. Tasty packed lunches were ready after breakfast if we were going out to eat. Every last detail was taken care of from luggage storage to airport shuttles to hotel and refugio check-ins. All permits and fees were paid. All of our meals and lodging was covered and covered well with lovely accommodations and outstanding restaurants. All local tips to the drivers, local guides, and hotels were covered, except for our WTREK guides and our active guide. And since you paid for the trip before you even got there, you don't get a nasty surprise in your credit card when you get home because you really have to go into your pocket or pull out a credit card. And active gets you the best guides. In the industry, they have a great reputation of taking care of their guides, so they get to choose from among the best, and it shows. So that's why I keep promoting active adventures and encourage you to try them out. I'll admit, some of the tours look expensive, but when you figure out that it's almost 100% inclusive, it makes the total much more palatable. And like I said, you'll have one heck of a great adventure and you won't be nickeled and dimed to death. My important big bucket list trips is not where I want to skimp. I want the fullest and best experience possible and I get that from Active. The next Active trip I want to take is their Mont Blanc trip and I booked that this summer of 2024. I checked and they still have spaces available if you'd like to join me. Peg, whom you met on the Morocco and the Dolomite Adventure is joining me. Why don't you come too? I'm also looking into doing another trip to Bhutan, possibly in fall of 2025. If that sounds like something you're interested in, also hit me up at kit at activetraveladventures.com. I think it's really fun that a lot of us are starting to travel together and well, I'm not actually the organizer. I'm more of the coordinator of getting the people together. So if it sounds like fun, let me know. And I'd love to hear about what adventures you've got planned. The Portuguese Camino that we're doing solo together in April of 25 is full, except for we're looking for one male roommate. So a solo guy, if you or you know somebody that might be interested, be sure to hit me up and I'll get you the information. I'm also looking at putting together a trip to Bhutan. One of the not one of the most fascinating country I've ever been to the most unique. Remember it's a country in the Himalayas outside Nepal and India that's never been conquered. So unlike most countries you go to, their culture is very homogenous and has not been infiltrated by other cultures. So you see it in its purest sense. I love the country and I look forward to going back and, and exploring more of it as well as some of the, the highlights that I'd like to show. If anybody wants to join me, hit me up at kid at activetraveladventures.com and I'll get you more information as we develop that plan. I hope you've enjoyed hiking, biking, and paddling in Patagonia with me today. I know I thoroughly enjoyed reliving it. It was one of the greatest adventures of my life and I cannot more strongly encourage you to add it to your bucket list. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on! Adventure on!